Hello and welcome to this video lecture on ethics and corporate responsibility. Ethics and corporate responsibility are hot topics and they always have been. Given the frailty of the human condition and the temptations of evil that are ever present in our lives, some people are extremely ethical and some are not. Some go above and beyond the law to do the right thing and others cheat the system at every chance. Sadly, sometimes the ethical business owners go out of business, and sadly, unethical ones prosper. You'll note that I refer to people as unethical, not to companies as unethical. We often read about Company X deciding to do this or that. Companies don't make decisions, people do. Companies don't behave ethically or unethically, people do. Historically, if a manager was unaware of illegal activities, the company could not be held responsible for an employee's unethical acts. However, under the 1991 U.S. Sentencing Commission guidelines, companies, companies can now be prosecuted and punished even if management did not know about the unethical behavior of an employee. Moreover, penalties can be substantial, with maximum fines approaching $300 million. Let's get started. Ethics is the set of moral principles, values, or obligations that define right and wrong for a person or a group. Between different cultures, ethics can differ greatly. For example, in Papua New Guinea, it is sometimes acceptable to engage in cannibalism. In the West, it is unethical, illegal, and completely abhorrent. Different strokes for different folks, as they say. Ethics can be seen through many different lenses or perspectives. Here are just three of them. The first perspective is universalism, which requires that all persons adhere to a universal set of ethical principles that are fundamental for society to function properly. These principles tend to prohibit acts like murder, deceit, and sabotage. The second perspective is utilitarianism, which suggests that an act that provides for the greatest number of the greatest good is an ethical act. On the other hand, Minor slights against individuals are not unethical under this doctrine as long as the slight benefits more people than it hurts. This perspective is borrowed by political scientists who espouse true democracy rather than a representative republic where everyone votes on everything and the majority rules even if the minority are irreparably harmed. There, the focus is on the larger collective society. A representative republic seeks to preserve the minority's rights by limiting the rule of the majority. Third perspective here is deontological. With this perspective, one has a duty, based upon the Greek word deon, to understand, engage in, and proceed with honesty, fairness, and respect. Adherents to this perspective seek to avoid behaviors that go against the strict norms of behavior, even if it hurts someone or some people. The real issue is how can managers incorporate any or some of these perspectives into how they manage a workplace? Ethical behavior conforms to a society's accepted principles of right and wrong. When those accepted behaviors change, then a manager is free to incorporate them into the workplace. But such norms are super slow to change, which is probably a good thing for society in general. If the norms of behavior change daily, it would be almost impossible to manage people, even to function effectively in a society. So managers must follow the stable principles and the values of society and model appropriate behavior for employees to follow. A disreputable leader only engenders bad behavior in others. Let's move on. Managers don't treat all ethical decisions the same. The manager who has to decide whether to deny or extend full insurance benefits to an employee's family is going to treat that decision 
much more seriously than the manager who has to deal with an assistant who has been taking office supplies home for personal use. The difference between these two situations is one of ethical intensity. Sometimes it's referred to as moral intensity. This is the perception about the severity of an issue. This is not an individual difference or a personality trait. It is a characteristic of the situation. Most people would surmise that denying benefits to an employee's entire family is much more intense situation than dealing with a post-it notes thief. Here are some factors that go into the determination of how severe or intense the ethical dilemma is. The magnitude of the consequences is the total harm or benefit derived from an ethical decision. In the case of the post-it notes thief, the consequences are fairly inconsequential. The social consensus is the agreement on whether behavior is bad or good. Most people would say that stealing anything is bad, but some would say that for something as inexpensive as post-it notes, it's probably not too bad. The probability of effect is the chance that something will happen and then result in harm to others. In the case of the employee benefits for family members, all people get sick from time to time, and sometimes their illness is severe. Being unable to afford medical treatment is sometimes a matter of life and death. Temporal immediacy is the time between an act and the consequences the act produces. Proximity of effect is the social, psychological, cultural, or physical distance of a decision maker to those affected by his or her decisions. Concentration of effect is how much an act affects the average person. With these thoughts in mind, it should be clear that, broadly speaking, ethical intensity is strong when decisions have large and immediate consequences or when those consequences are either physically or psychologically close to those affected by the decision. Let's move on. According to Kohlberg, ethical decisions are based at least in part on a person's level of moral development. Kohlberg identified three phases of individual moral development with two stages in each phase. At the pre-conventional level of moral development, people decide based on selfish reasons. In stage one, the punishment and obedience stage, your primary concern would be not to get in trouble. For example, a small child obeys his parents because of the threat of punishment. A manager obeys the laws because of fear of going to jail. As we proceed to stage two, the instrumental exchange stage, you make decisions that advance your personal wants and needs. For example, a small child bargains with his parents to get something from them in exchange for doing something that they like. At the conventional level of moral development, people make decisions that conform to conventional societal expectations. In stage three, the so-called good boy, nice girl stage, you normally do what the other good boys and nice girls are doing. Children on the playground learn how to interact with others by watching acceptable behavior. They do the approved things that others do. Managers mimic the behavior of other managers that they learn about through personal interaction or public pronouncements. In the law and order stage, stage four, you do whatever the law permits. Children on the playground take multiple turns in a row on a playground ride even though others want to ride because there is no punishment against hogging a playground piece. Managers push the limits of their behavior and their decisions to the very edge of illegality. At the post-conventional level of moral maturity, people always use internalized ethical principles to solve ethical dilemmas. In stage five, the social contract stage, you would consider the effects of your decision on others. Children on the playground decide to let others use the equipment as long as they are in line to do so. Managers have internalized proper ethical behavior and decisions to the point that they no longer fear prison or the scorn of others because they're always doing the right thing. In stage six, 
the universal universal principle stage, excuse me, you make ethical decisions based on your principles of right and wrong. Children learn that it is wrong to hog the playground equipment and would not think of doing such a thing to the other children. Managers make ethical decisions as part of their very second nature. That is, they don't even have to think about right and wrong in this stage because that knowledge is now part of them. Let's move on. Ethical principles have in common the fact that they encourage managers and employees to take others' interest into account when making ethical decisions. At the same time, however, these principles can lead to very different ethical actions. Ethical decisions are based upon a bunch of factors. Here are some things that go into making ethical decisions and engaging in ethical behavior. Long-term self-interest dictates that one should never take any action that is not in your organization's long-term self-interest. While it sounds as if the principle of self-interest promotes selfishness, it doesn't. What we do to maximize our long-term interest, like save more, spend less, exercise every day, watch what we eat, is often very different from what we do to maximize short-term interest like maxing out our credit cards, being a couch potato, eating whatever we want. The principle of personal virtue holds that you should never do anything that is not honest, open, and truthful, and that you would not be glad to see reported in the news media. That last one about the news media is a big one. Would your family be embarrassed if they read it online or in the newspaper? Religious injunctions require that one never take any action that is not kind and that does not build a sense of community. Government requirements dictate that one should never take any action that violates the law because the law represents the bare minimum moral standard. Regarding utilitarian benefits, one should never take any action that does not result in a greater good for society. Individual rights require that one should never take any action that infringes on others' agreed-upon rights. The influence of distributive justice dictates that one should never take any action that harms the very least among us, such as the poor, the uneducated, and the unemployed. Now, some of these influences are internally directed, and some are externally directed. The influences of self-interest and personal virtue mainly regard how one thinks about their self. But the others are focused on the good of others. Rarely is there a decision at work or in life that has absolutely no effect on anyone else. So the area between internalized influences and externalized foci is blurry or gray at the very least. Let's move on. Workplace deviance is unethical behavior that violates organizational norms about what is right and wrong. Workplace deviance is also known as counterproductive work behavior, or CWB, and it costs companies almost a trillion dollars a year. Workplace deviance varies along two dimensions. The degree of seriousness and the target of the deviance. Because it is essentially a two by two matrix, we have four types of deviance. The first is production deviance, which hurts the quality and quantity of work produced. Examples include leaving work early, taking excessive breaks, intentionally working slow, wasting resources. So production deviance is minor and targets the organization. So it's in the top left quadrant. Property deviance is unethical behavior aimed at company property or company productions. Examples include sabotaging equipment, accepting kickbacks, lying about hours worked, stealing from the company. Employee shrinkage is a type of property deviance. It's employee theft of company merchandise. Property deviance is very serious and targets the organization, so it's in the top right quadrant. 
Political deviance is when one uses their influence to harm others in the company via personal aggression and personal behavior towards others. Examples include showing favoritism, gossiping about coworkers, blaming coworkers. These things are all bad, but they're minor in their severity, and they target individuals, so they are in the bottom left quadrant. Personal aggression as a form of deviance involves things like sexual harassment, verbal abuse, stealing from coworkers, endangering coworkers' safety. This form of deviance also targets individuals, but it is of the serious type, so it's in the bottom right quadrant. In a nutshell, production deviance and property deviance harm the company whereas political deviance and personal aggression harm individuals within the company. Additionally, deviance directed at both the organization and at individuals can range in severity from minor to serious. Let's move on. Corporate social responsibility is a business's obligation to pursue policies, make decisions, and take actions that benefit society. This is an expansion of personal ethical decisions and behaviors to the very corporate level with regard to what's right and wrong. According to Nobel Prize-winning economist Milton Friedman, the only social responsibility that organizations have is to satisfy their owners, that is, company shareholders. This view, called the shareholder model, holds that the only social responsibility that businesses have is to maximize profits. By maximizing profit, the firm maximizes shareholder wealth and satisfaction. More specifically, as profits rise, the company stock owned by company shareholders generally increases in value. By contrast, under the stakeholder model, Management's most important responsibility is long-term survival, not just maximizing profits, which is achieved by satisfying the interest of multiple corporate stakeholders, not just shareholders. Stakeholders are people or groups with a legitimate interest in a company. Since stakeholders are interested in and affected by the organization's actions, they have a stake in what those actions are. Consequently, stakeholder groups may try to influence the firm to act in their own interest. Stakeholders include owners and stockholders, but also local neighbors, the natural environment, national well-being, etc. Let's move on. A century ago, society expected businesses to meet their economic and legal responsibilities and very little else. Today, however, when society judges whether businesses are socially responsible, ethical and discretionary responsibilities are considerably more important than they used to be. Historically, economic responsibility, that is, making a profit by producing a product or service valued by society, has been a business's most basic social responsibilities. Organizations that don't meet their financial and economic expectations can come under tremendous pressure. If a company goes out of business, then all of the best laid plans go away. If they are not in business, they can't do good. So this is a requirement. Legal responsibility is the expectation that companies will obey a society's laws and regulations as they try to meet their economic responsibilities. Companies that do not abide by the law can face massive fines, and the managers can even go to prison in some instances. So, a company can violate the law and stay in business. But in today's 24-7 news world, many customers will boycott companies that break the law, so they are faced with a double whammy of fines and or imprisonment, as well as massive economic losses resulting from customer boycotts. Ethical responsibility is society's expectation that organizations will not violate accepted principles of right and wrong when conducting their business. Because different stakeholders may disagree about what is or is not ethical, meeting ethical responsibilities is more difficult than meeting economic or legal responsibilities. 
This can be a very gray area for some managers who are driven by the dual and competing forces of the need to earn profits with the need to engage in sometimes expensive actions to abide by ethical concerns. They certainly are not forced to be ethical, but customer backlash and employee concerns can be expensive for them. It's just always best to always do the right thing. There might be short-term costs, but these are almost always overcome with long-term well-being. Discretionary responsibilities pertain to the social roles that businesses play in society beyond their economic, legal, and ethical responsibilities. This is where companies who are profitable, legal, and ethical can engage in acts that are good for society. Usually, having society become aware of the good acts can be part of the motivation to engage in them. More on that later. Let's move on. For companies who want to be engaged in corporate social responsibility, here are a few common examples of how they do it. Environmental management policies seek to improve the environment locally, nationally, and globally. Currently, there is a big issue with child labor mining in Africa for lithium and other minerals. A responsible company would refuse to buy those minerals from such places. African minerals are typically cheaper than when mined in, say, Alaska. However, if their competitors continue to use African minerals, then they have a competitive advantage based upon the lower cost of their inputs. The only solution is for everyone to stop buying any product of child labor. But that is a tall order indeed. Work-life programs are in high demand, especially by those trying to juggle the responsibilities of child rearing combined with a full-time career pursuit. In order to attract workers, companies now advertise their family-friendly work-life balance initiatives that ease the burden of full-time work with family responsibilities by providing what is known as paid time off instead of carving such things into separate vacation days and separate sick days. Vacations have to be scheduled and sick days sometimes require a physician's note. But PTO, or paid time off, can be used anytime with or without a reason. Other programs include free or reduced price health club memberships, on-site or subsidized child care, etc. Just about anything designed to make an employee's life better outside of work falls in the category of work-life balance. Social leaves of absence are provided by some socially conscious companies to pursue charitable endeavors of interest to the employees. These leaves almost never come with pay, but they do allow you to keep your job while you're off teaching, say, underprivileged children in Appalachia or Malawi or some such. Community development projects are often used by companies to show the neighborhood and the world that they are not all evil, money-grubbing bloodsuckers. If a company is in a so-called bad part of town, they can help the city overcome blight, poverty, and crime by funding local parks and establishing boys and girls clubs so the local children have a safe place to go after school. Compassionate downsizing involves outplacement service for those who are downsized out of a job. Those losing their jobs are given interview training and job search assistance. Sometimes companies have to let people go, but rather than impersonally handing them a pink slip on Friday, companies can be compassionate about it. This helps their reputation with those folks and with others who may apply for jobs there later. It should be noted that companies rarely engage in socially responsible behavior without letting anyone else know. It's part public relations, part good business, and sometimes only a smidgen out of the kindness of their heart. You can see giant billboards announcing corporate donations to this or that. If it was truly out of altruism, nobody would know. Altruism is expensive. So it rarely exists naturally in companies. Let's move on.
It seems that some companies nowadays are being forced to comply with social responsibility mandates by any number of stakeholder groups. Others engage in corporate responsibility of their own volition. When companies are pressured from internal or external stakeholders to be socially responsible, they can take one of four different strategies to be socially responsive. Social responsiveness is a strategy chosen by a company to respond to stakeholders' economic, legal, ethical, or discretionary expectations regarding their social responsibility. A reactive strategy is when a company does less than society expects. So if a company is being pressured to recover some of its waste in a recycling effort, they may recover some and choose not to recover at all and then claim that they're generally recovering waste. Just how much waste is being recovered might never be revealed as this strategy rarely works in the long term, but it can stave off some demands from stakeholders. A defensive strategy is when a company admits responsibility for a problem, but does the absolute least required to meet societal expectations. In this strategy, a company only does what is needed to do and nothing more. Stakeholders may ask that they, for example, reduce their waste by 50%. They reluctantly agree to meet their demand and only that demand. Sometimes they'll even announce that they're willing to meet the demands, but they will not reduce their waste by 51%. It's 50%. An accommodative strategy is when a company accepts responsibility for a problem and does all that society expects to solve that problem. In the first two strategies, reactive and defensive, the response is only because of stakeholder demands without admitting fault. Companies seek to minimally address the concerns. In an accommodative strategy, companies willingly admit fault and do their very best to solve the problem. For example, in the 1980s, Tylenol bottles were being tampered with by some crazed killer who snuck in cyanide in some of the capsules in some of the bottles. Several people died. In reaction, the makers of Tylenol removed every single bottle of its product from every single store shelf at huge, great expense so that more people would not die. This was an accommodative strategy. Tylenol also then made their products with tamper-proof seals that are used on every over-the-counter pharmaceutical product in every store nowadays. A proactive strategy is when a company anticipates responsibility for a problem before the problem occurs and does more than society expects to address the problem. For example, when Tylenol's competitors realized that their products could be tampered with, they proactively started using tamper-proof seals themselves because of the threat that crazy people would expand the evil plan that befell Tylenol. In the case of a potential corporate polluter, a company might go to the expense of installing expensive waste recovery systems in place, even if no stakeholder group is concerned with them. Because if they come for that company next, the company can avoid any protest. Let's move on. Well, that's all for now. Thanks.